Hi everyone, please welcome to John Maddock Hall and his talk, Caninos Locos, Creation of a Nation Yacht Innovation Platform, and let's give him an applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have been coming to Latin America for over 25 years. I started coming here in the early days of Linux. And what I saw was a very entrepreneurial population. They often were forming little companies, trying to make money, trying to make a business. I saw many conferences about free software. In fact, Brazil was one of the first countries that really embraced free software in government and in industry. One of the first companies to actually embed Linux into a router was here in Brazil. I also saw great university systems where if it's a federal university or a state university, often the tuition was free. And it was here in 1996 that I saw my first Beowulf supercomputer in real life. I saw lots of research and development being done with free software. And what I also saw was billions of reais being paid to go outside of Brazil and outside of Latin America to the United States or to China to purchase software or hardware that could be manufactured and designed here. And what this means is that not only are you losing a lot of your money for things that you don't have to pay for, but it also means that there's less money to pay local software and hardware designers here in Latin America. So I've often had goals of a project of using free software and free hardware or open hardware, to lower the cost of computers for education. We'll get more into that in a moment. I wanted to create a single board computer design and manufacture that in Latin America. This design and this, this capability means that it would create more jobs and interesting jobs for people in Latin America and therefore reduce the flow of people in Latin America going to the United States, going to China, going to Europe, because they say this is where the interesting jobs are. Let's have the interesting jobs here. You have a beautiful country, you have fantastic weather, great food, and beautiful women, and not to be sexist, also beautiful men. And I wanted to reduce this balance of trade deficit for computer hardware and software. Now, about 12 years ago, there were these professors at the University of Cambridge who saw that students coming into their classes actually knew less about computers than the students of 20 years before that. Because in present day, a student goes to the store they buy a laptop computer or a desktop computer, and on that computer someplace is this little sticker that says, if you open up this case, you void your warranty. And because they paid a lot of money for that laptop or a lot of money for that desktop, they don't open it up. And today, the student goes and buys a game in binary-only form. They don't see how the game works. They, don't un they can't change the game. And then maybe they write a little bit of HTML for their website, and they say, oh, I'm a programmer. Well, no, I'm sorry. This is not programming. This is not computer science. And 20 years before that, you might get a VIC-20 or some other small computer. You would pull down the source code from a bulletin board or some website and then you would try and get it to work. And you might have these errors called syntax errors or runtime errors. And you would have to figure out what that error was and you would have to fix it. And that's why the students of 30 years ago knew more about computers than the students of 
12 years ago. So these professors decided to create the Raspberry Pi, a computer that purposely did not have a case, that was purposely small and cheap enough that if a student destroyed it, they didn't care. The, the target price was $35, which the Raspberry Pi Association continues to support that as their target price today. And at first they thought, oh, we'll only need 1,000 of these. And then very quickly they realized they need 10,000 of these. And actually before they took their first order, they had orders for 100,000 of these. And today the Raspberry Pi has sold millions and millions of systems all over the world for about the price of 35 US dollars. Now the problem that is, happens in Brazil, and for the most part in lots of other Latin American countries, is that there is a large import duty on these computers. And in Brazil, in particular, the import duty is 100% of the value of the imported product. And they consider the value to not only be the price you pay for the product, but also the shipping and also the insurance. So that a $35 computer purchased from the United States with $20 of shipping and $5 of insurance reaches the Brazilian border with a price or a value of 60 US dollars. It is then hit by 100% duty and is now 120 US dollars. And then if, the, if it's a company that wanted to buy these and perhaps sell them for a profit, it means that the street price is 150 US dollars. And quite frankly, that's for a population whose personal GDP or personal wealth per year is perhaps two thirds that of the United States. So this means that to them, it's like it costs 200 US dollars. And while a parent might say, okay, I'll purchase one of these computers for $35, and if my, student, if my child destroys it, it's only $35. You think twice if it's $200. You say, okay, you destroyed the first one, but don't destroy the second one, right? So this is a problem. And in addition to that, the number of Raspberry Pis coming into Brazil was such a small number that nobody bothered to get them certified by ANTEL, which is your radio certification organization. And so in reality, all of these computers, if they had Wi-Fi on them, or if they had Bluetooth, were actually illegal. And you know, so getting that certification is important, but it's also a lot of money. It costs about 60,000 US dollars to get Antel certification if all you do is give the system to Antel and say, you do the work. So these were you know, very expensive. Now, if you had manufactured that computer inside of Brazil, then, and you followed all of the rules and laws of importing the components, you find out that you may only have to pay between 6 and 16% of the value of the product. And in some cases, in some parts that are not made in Brazil, you don't have to pay any import duty. But as soon as you take those two parts and put them together, they are no longer components taxed at 6% but they are a finished product which is taxed at 100%. And so that's the secret here is to keep these things as separate, the components as separate as humanly possible, and to also buy them in bulk to keep down your shipping costs, and to manufacture them here in Brazil. So the University of Sao Paulo is a very large university. It's one of the best universities in Latin America. They have 16,000 PhDs and 100,000 students. And they also have a complete surface mount technology machine, the robot that puts these components onto the printed circuit board 
And they could actually produce systems. In fact, this, this surface mount technology machine that they have is the same type of machine that is used to produce cell phones by LG. So when I met Professor Zufo, who is the head of the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department, I told him that I heard certain insights. That even though the Chinese people do get paid less per person, per hour, than people in Brazil, the fact is that the robot, the machine that actually does the work in Brazil, gets paid no more money than the machine in China. It's a machine. You don't pay it an hourly wage. And so if you're producing 10,000 of these little single board computers a day, you divide up the amount of money and difference between the 10 or 15 people working on that machine. And, you know, and it's a small amount of money. At most, it's $1 per CPU, $1 per board. And given the same components, you can produce exactly the same computer. So if you took a design that was done in China, and you said to the Chinese, OK, we're going to pay you a license fee for your design, or we're going to buy the components from you in bags so that we're using exactly the same components exactly the same design, and it's just two different robots that are putting these pieces onto the printed circuit board, you're going to end up with exactly the same computer, which means when you put the operating system on it, it's going to work exactly the same. And then you spread all the other things, the certifications, the testing and things, you find out that you could actually produce these machines for one or two dollars more than you would uh, in China. But you say, okay, if this is true, why don't more companies actually build these little single board computers? Why do all these companies in China produce these computers and sell them? Why can't we do this? There are actually 150 different companies in Brazil that have these surface mount technology machines. But they don't produce these little computers. Why not? It costs about two to three million dollars to design one of these computers. You have to hire the engineers. They have to do the design. You have to get some components to build prototypes. You know, it costs money to fit this design onto the surface mount technology machine to program it itself. You have to set up the ability to, to import these parts. You have to store them. It's a lot of money just to do the design work. And then after you've produced the little computer, you need to have an operating system on it. Well, that's easy, right? It's Linux, no problem, except you have to have device drivers for the individual components which you put on the board. And you want to make sure that the operating system works on your board. And then after you've done all that work, you also have to create a market for it. And maybe you say, here's my computer, and everybody goes, oh, it's terrible. I hate it. And you don't sell any of them. And now you're Three to four million dollars of investment is worthless. So what these companies do is they produce things designed by other people that they already know that there's a market for them. Or they manufacture something which is so simple it needs relatively small engineering. Memory dims, flash sticks, that they know there's a big market for these. And that's what they produce. Or they're a specialty house that produces something that has a huge profit margin. Medical equipment, industrial-based products that have to work in high temperatures. And so that's what they concentrate on, not 
the little single board computers like the Raspberry Pi. And so that's why these boards are not designed here in Brazil. However, at the University of Sao Paulo, there is this nonprofit organization called LSI Tech. They're specifically designed to help companies design printed circuit boards, design things, desktop TVs, things like that. And they have this surface mount technology machine, this robot that can produce these boards. They first design what they call CAD files, sometimes these are called Gerbers, that tell the robot how to put the parts onto the printed circuit board and actually how to produce the printed circuit board in the first place. And then they take the circuit design and fit it to produce the computers. Now here's the original Raspberry Pi. It was a single core 32-bit computer. It only had half a gigabyte of RAM. It had no real I.O. controller, like a uh, SATA controller. It had USB 2.0, which quite frankly is slower than molasses on a cold day. But it was $35, and it just hit the world by, by uh, storm. And in addition to that, they created a foundation which helped to publicize it, helped to create little projects, and got people's imaginations going. And they created companies to distribute this throughout the world, except in Brazil. Yes, there was a company in Brazil that did distribute it. It was called named Farnell. But they were up against this very high import tax. And after a while, Farnell stopped distributing the Raspberry Pi in Brazil. And so the only way you could really get the Raspberry Pi was to have your favorite uncle coming back from the United States, please put one in my, in my luggage and, you know, bring it to me. But that's not the way you can create a business or a product out of this. There are some small companies like Filippi Flop that also report the Raspberry Pi, and they work very hard to do that. But again, they can't import them in large quantities. It's difficult. So we went to the Raspberry Pi Foundation. I happen to know a couple of the people on the board of directors for the Raspberry Pi Foundation. And I invited one of them to come to Brazil to see Campus Party in Sao Paulo, to see the excitement and the, and the technical expertise that Brazilians have, in particular. And we invited them to other campus parties throughout Latin America. And they came and they were very interested. And so we spent two years working with them. We actually produced 10 Raspberry Pis here in Brazil, five at the university and five at a different company. And they all worked. And after two years, they said no. They didn't really tell us why they said no. But we think it's because the Raspberry Pi Foundation is a British organization. And they had a surface mount technology machine in Wales, which is a country in the United Kingdom. And this is producing jobs for people in Wales. And so they didn't see a, a need to have a Raspberry Pi manufacturing plant in Brazil. Now, in addition to all of that, there are some technical issues with the Raspberry Pi line. This has changed somewhat with the Raspberry Pi 4, so pardon me that I have not worked that into the talk yet. But up until the Raspberry Pi 3, they only had one gigabyte of RAM for the Raspberry Pi. And you, when you try and run certain types of programs and applications on the Raspberry Pi, you really need more than one gigabyte of RAM to have the application work successfully. And this makes it even worse if your processor is a 64-bit processor because typically you have about 30% larger code with a 64-bit system because of the larger addresses than you do with a 32-bit system. The Raspberry Pis up until the 4 
had only USB 2 at 428 megabits a second. USB 3 is 5 gigabits a second. USB 3.1 is 10 gigabits a second. So if what you're trying to do is I.O. to a disk through USB 2, it's going to be relatively slow. The operating temperature of the Raspberry Pi is between 40 to 50 degrees Celsius. In Brazil, room temperature in Recife is 45 degrees Celsius. That's with the air conditioner going. And so it's very difficult to operate a Raspberry Pi without a fan in, in those type of temperatures. Now, the Raspberry Pi 4 is actually worse than this. It uses so much power, it produces so much heat, that pictures of the Raspberry Pi 4 show it with a huge fan and cooling tower on it. So they've actually gone a little bit backwards from the Raspberry Pi 3 with the Raspberry Pi 4. The Raspberry Pis had no infrared control on them. If you wanted to use them to control your TV with, like, say, Kodi, you needed to add an infrared USB uh, device to the board. Electrostatic discharge is very important. If you have a bare board with no protection and you shuffle across the carpet and you touch the board, you could actually damage the board with the static coming from your hands. It isn't hard to build fairly good electrostatic protection into a board. It only costs about 15 or 20 cents per board to put that in. But the Raspberry Pi people did not. And consequently, the raspberries are susceptible to electrostatic discharge. There's no flash on the board. You have to put your operating system and your programs onto a micro SD card. This has two problems. Number one, it makes the whole system a little bit more expensive, both adding the micro SD card and adding the, micro, uh, the, the, the reader itself. But it also slows down the system because accessing the data on the micro SD card is slower than accessing the data through flash. And so having flash on the board makes a lot of sense from a speed perspective and a cost perspective. And finally, the Raspberry Pi typically is a single board design. So if you prototype, use it to prototype a solution for a customer, it's difficult to then reduce the number of components on the board to allow you to reduce the cost and the reliability and the power usage of your solution to your customer. So the single board design makes the commercial designs more difficult and expensive. The fact that the Wi-Fi is built on the board makes it harder to import to countries without getting uh, Antel or FCC certification. And the finished product makes importing more expensive. So we developed an overall plan at LSI Tech to design these systems. And we also did not intend on turning the university and LSI Tech into a manufacturing facility. Our idea was to have them do the design, that two to three million dollars worth of design, get it to work on one S&T line, and then license this out to all the little companies throughout Brazil who have S&T lines for them to compete with each other based on ability to manufacture, service to the customer, locality of the systems, and so forth. So that we would stimulate this production inside of Brazil and the rest of Latin America. We would then be able to utilize the existing distributors like Aero or Farnell to sell these to retailers and to end users. And then we would start doing this with other designs producing them. Now, in Latin America, there's this facility called, or an agreement called the Mercosur Agreement. And the Mercosur Agreement says, if Brazil was to produce a product that 22% or more of the product came from Brazil, 
that they could then sell it to other countries as part of the Mercosur Agreement with no additional import duty. Argentina, as an example, pays 50% import duty on things like the Raspberry Pi because they're produced outside of the Mercosur countries. So we could actually sell our computers to Argentina cheaper than Argentina can buy them from China for the same thing. And so this is not just about Brazil. It's not even just about the Mercosur countries. It's about all of the countries in Latin America, even some of them that don't have a high import duty from other countries. So in addition to all of this, by having the work done locally, we can talk with the individual customers to do things like, oh, you need a computer that can operate at 100 degrees Celsius. That's if you're going to put it in a car, if you're going to put it in a tank or a plane or something like that. You need it to work in a high dust environment. Yes, we can do that for you. And, and that is part of the design capabilities at the university. But in addition to that, the computer that we're designing is actually made up of two boards, one of which is a very high speed, very complex board, which we call the core board, that has the CPU, the memory, the flash, and all the high-speed components, the, the GPU, all the high-speed components on that board, which is then attached to a second board called the motherboard or the daughter board, depending on how you look at it, that has all the I.O. components on it, all the power components. And this allows you to change the daughter card which is only four layers and relatively easy to design, while keeping the core board manufactured in large quantities to cut the price down. The core board is eight layers and is a lot harder to design because it's running at much higher frequencies than the daughter card is. So one of the ways of cutting the cost is saying, oh, I don't need to have a hard ether that on the board. I can take that off. I don't need to have an interface for a camera on the board. I can take that off. I don't need to have 40 GPIO pins on the board. I can take that off. And all of these things can reduce the cost of the daughter card and also make it more reliable and use less electricity while keeping the core board the same. And so we were designing this in order to make it more flexible and create customized solutions. And these daughter cards can easily be designed any place. So the daughter cards could be designed in Argentina and manufactured there. They could be designed in, in Colombia and manufactured there. And if they have the capabilities of manufacturing the core board, they could do that too. But there's a long-term goal. And it's a long-term goal of Debian. It's been the long-term goal of the Free Software Foundation to create a completely blobless computer. No blobs for the video cards. No blobs for the device drivers. No blobs any place. So that you could see everything inside of the operating system and everything inside of the chip. Now, I know a lot of you have heard about spyware, malware, being in the operating system, being in the compilers. It can actually be inside of the CPU chip. An Intel chip has firmware in it. The firmware is a tiny little program. And that firmware could be changed to create a trap door inside the chip that you would never see if you looked at just the operating system or just the compiler code. And so if you create a completely open chip, people would be able to look at the mask of the chip, they'd be able to follow the manufacturing process, and be able to convince themselves that this chip is completely OK. And that is part of our program. The University of Sao Paulo 
has the ability and the expertise to create a Wi-Fi chip that's completely open, a GPU that's completely open. I mean, you may still have GPUs that are closed, that are made by people like ARM or made by people like NVIDIA, and they may give you a huge amount of performance. But a lot of applications don't need that huge amount of performance. And even a lower performing chip, which is completely open, is more valuable than a chip which is higher performing and is closed. And so the university is working in the long run to have completely open hardware and completely open software. It's not to say that our first step on this has met that ideal. We do have some closed chips in our first board, but we want to replace those with completely open chips over time. And so we've created the first system called the Labrador. We have actually produced a thousand of these boards at the university. At this point, we're creating what we call seed units that go out to developers, go out to people that are trying to make products out of it, that it will drive a demand for the purchase of more components, which will drive down the cost. These are specifications of the first board, which we call the Labrador. The name of the program is Caninos Lucus, Crazy Canines. A little bit in honor of me, the bad dog, who had came up with the idea in the first place. Dr. Marcelo Zufo is another co-conspirator. He has a dog name. And we name each one of the computers after a dog. So Labrador is our friendly dog, very intelligent dog, and we named our first computer after that. Now, we think that this has a lot of technical superiority to the Raspberry Pi, especially the Raspberry Pi 3, because it has two gigabytes of RAM for only a 32-bit processor. It runs at a faster clock speed than the Raspberry Pi. The testing between this board and the Raspberry Pi 3, this board runs applications at least as fast as the Raspberry Pi, sometimes twice as fast, and sometimes three times as fast. It has USB 3 and USB 2. So you can hook a, you can hook a two and a half inch disc on here and actually use the board's power to drive the two and a half inch SATA disc. It has an operating temperature of 70 degrees Celsius. So even in the 45 degree temperature of Hasifi, you still have 25 degrees of difference in that. That could typically be handled by a heat sink. And our latest core boards only use one watt of electrical power. That's such a small amount of electrical power, it doesn't generate a lot of excess heat. IR control is on the motherboard. The Wi-Fi chip is on the motherboard. And we have very good electrostatic protection. We have 16 gigabytes of flash directly on the core board. So if you were to create an application that uses only the core board and your own design of the motherboard, you have the 16 gigabytes of flash on there. So as far as commercial superiority to Raspberry Pi, the dual board design gives you the ability to prototype with your Labrador. And then once you have your application developed, you can create your own motherboard to run your application. And when I say a motherboard, a lot of people think, oh yeah, the motherboard, this little four inch, five by four inch board, that's your motherboard. Your motherboard is actually an elevator. Your motherboard could be a 747 airplane. The motherboard could be your car. It's what the core board, with the brains of the computer, is going to slide into. That's your motherboard. And that's why it's so important that th there be a standard that connects your core board with your motherboard so that as the core board changes and gets faster and better and cheaper, you can replace the old core board with a new one, change the operating system, and be able to use the same 
airplane, elevator, and car that you had before. In addition to all this, the Brazilian government started up what they call the National IoT Program, the National Internet of Things Program. They estimate that over the next 20 years, there's going to be $200 billion worth of IoT-related technologies done in Brazil alone. And because of this, they're willing to invest 20 billion US dollars in the development of this program. This program needs both hardware and software as platforms for doing this. And they have accepted the Labrador as one of the key components of that hardware platform. So Caninos Locos has been recognized as being the national IoT hardware platform. And we came up with three designs. The Labrador, which we've already talked about. A bank car, which is a large guard dog, which we're going to be using as a server system or an IoT gateway. And finally, a pulga, a flea. A very, very small sensor computer about the size of a 10 cent piece. We were going to call it the Chihuahua, but we figured everybody hates Chihuahuas, so we called it the Pulga, or Flea. The Pulga has a very small uh, CPU on it. It's currently based on the ARM Cortex uh, systems, and it can run off of, a flat, off of a watch battery for about six months. If you put the bat watch batteries in parallel, it will run for a year. It also has 512 kbytes of flash and 128 kilobytes of, of, of RAM memory. And it's a very small weight. It uses Bluetooth mesh or LoRaWAN to communicate. And we believe that we could manufacture this for about one US dollar a piece or less. With the SMT line we have, we could produce 270,000 of these every day. So there's other ways of powering it. You could use a supercapacitor, a solar cell attached to that. There's also a different design of the, of the Pulga. It's much about the size of a credit card. And that can have more sensors on it and more abilities to gather data. So we're looking for applications for the Labrador. One application is called Udu. It's a point of sale and ERP system that's open source. You may go to a supermarket and you see that they have a scanner. They scan your food. They weigh your bananas. They, they print off your receipt. They have an LCD panel, a keyboard, and a mouse. This is something that you could replace with cheap components. But if you buy this system from Oracle or you buy it from one of the other commercial vendors, it may cost you $3,000 for this. We could do the same thing with a Labrador, some cheap USB devices for $300. And the rest of the money could go into your pocket or save the small business person a lot of money in trying to implement that. Most of you are familiar with Kodi. It's a multimedia system. It's free software. Kodi runs on the Labrador. We could take an inexpensive LCD panel, keyboard, and mouse, make the, the Labrador actually replace the Wi-Fi router in your house, hook your modem directly up to the hardwired Ethernet port, and then the Labrador becomes your router. It becomes your first connection to the Internet. It becomes your multimedia center. Put a pair of inexpensive speakers on there, and allow people to have access and to have a nice multimedia center. Add a webcam for security and IoT controls for home automation. You have a very nice system that people could make money in selling and supporting. Freedom Box is a small server. It's free software. All the components of Freedom Box are actually in the Debian distribution. You can set up a small server for your house, a web server, you could have you know, a Tor server, everything you want 
just with the Freedom Box software. And the Labrador could drive that in people's homes. As an example of a nicer, of a, of a more funny application, Frets on Fire, which is the open source version of Guitar Hero, works in the Labrador, add a couple guitars, I want to have it at campus party in Sao Paulo next year. In examples of IoT, the government is looking for applications for agriculture, for tracking sick cows, for finding out how much fertilizer is needed in farmers' fields, to cut down the price of the fertilization, but also to keep the fertilizer out of streams and rivers where it creates uh, algae growth and things like that. Health uh, applications and smart cities Rio de Janeiro is using small computers like this to figure out where the traffic jams are and where floods are starting to happen. We have many different partners in this program. Companies like Smart, which produce memories and stuff inside of Brazil, BNDES, which is the investment bank in Brazil, they're all working with this. But you can be one of our partners. You can conceive of new solutions utilizing the Labrador and utilizing the Internet of Things platform, and you can start to design and produce these solutions for sale inside of Brazil and around the world. Why should other countries be doing this? The price of being able to create a solution has dropped to the point where you can be the next Mark Zuckerberg. Don't do that. You can be better than him. You can do research on batteries and supercapacitors and things, and you can help people learn Internet of Things. Now, we have a certain amount of resources that are available. You can go to the caninaslucas.org website, find out more about the boards and the systems. There's a free online IoT class created by the University of Sao Paulo, sponsored by Samsung, where you can get actually uh, if both the free information, it's in Spanish, English, and Portuguese. Currently, it's using the Arduino to teach Internet of Things. We're adding the Labrador to it. And the company that I am uh, chairman of the board, uh, LPI.org, we're going to be doing a certification on Internet of Things so you can study on your own, but also get certified. And actually, as a little plug, Cesar Broad is here. He is uh, he's offering a limited number of certifications from LPI at half price here at DebConf. Raise your hand, Susser, so I know you. Okay. If you're interested in that, go see Susser. What, what is the software status of this? We have the 3.0 kernel. We have every driver for that other than the infrared. We've been working on the 4.19 kernel getting drivers to be put into it with Debian 10 support, and also the 5.x kernel series. We need to have people help us write device drivers for the missing device drivers in the 4.19 kernel. Some of this information may be upported from the uh, 3.10 kernel. We would love to have help doing that. We also need to update U-Boot uh, to have PowerVR support and also USB keyboard. Some of that is already there. We need some help in doing that. We need to update the device tree in both U-Boot and Linux. And we need to test the 5.x kernels to be able to see if any of them work and how much they work and where they need work done to them. Then we need to upstream all the code. We want every single thing about the Labrador and about Caninos Locos to be upstream. There's not going to be any proprietary code in this over time. So we need to design and embrace this program and Debian. We want Debian to be the official distribution. Not Ubuntu, not Mint, not Red Hat. I mean, it's fine if those want to port. But we are concentrating on Debian. And we want people to innovate with this hardware. So if you're willing to help, Augusto is, I don't, I don't know if he's here in the room. He's going to be giving a talk. Oh, there he is back there. Augusto works at LSI Tech, and we've set up a website. You can go see him. 
you're going to say you're setting up a Telegram channel and you know convey to him your contact information, your expertise, and if you can help, we'll make sure you get a Labrador to help with. This is Dr. Zufo and I holding the first Labrador that came off of the of the pipe. With that, I thank you very much for listening. There will also be a talk in Portuguese at five o'clock today. Uh, Augusto did the talk a couple days ago for Deb Camp, but it wasn't recorded properly, so they're going to give it again and record it properly at 5 o'clock. So if you know anybody that feels more comfortable listening to this in Portuguese than English, please let them know that the talk is going to be given at 5 o'clock here in the auditorium. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much. It looks wonderful. Um, I'm a little concerned um, with your comments about temperature. Um, you were saying that the Raspberry Pi it runs at an operating temperature of between 35 and 40 degrees. It's uh, 40, 40 degrees. Okay, 40, 40 degrees. On the Labrador, you were saying it was running at 70. Yes. And yet, for the Raspberry Pi, you were saying it wasn't suitable for use in Brazil because of the high temperatures. Yes. So how does the Labrador work in Brazil? with a 30 degree higher processor. No, 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 no. The temperature, the temperature, the operating temperature it, ru it runs at is, um, is set at 70 degrees. So when you look at a piece of hardware, it says what is the operating temperature range? Yeah, typically um, commercial will be up to 85 degrees centigrade. Right, the Raspberry Pi, the operating temperature range is up to 50 degrees Celsius. The Labrador we've tested up to 70 degrees Celsius. So you're, okay, so you're saying your operating temperature is up to 50 degrees centigrade, um, uh, sorry, 70 degrees centigrade ambient air temperature. Right, right, I now understand what you're saying. Right, that's the ambient temperature that we guarantee it to work in and, and not need, you know, with, with a heat sink, you know. Okay, and, yep, that's fine. Okay. I, I understand what you're now saying. Um, and the second point is, you were saying that uh, an eMMC is radically faster than a micro SD card. How? When, when the micro SD card is going through the USB 2 bus, yes. But if it's going through an MMC bus, um, it's the same microcontroller, it's the, uh, it's the same controller on board, it's the same physical bus infrastructure. There's different, there's different speeds of eMMC though, they're not yeah, all but the same. The, and that's true of uh, an SD card. They, they use the same controllers, they use the same MMC bus. But we, we are, we're using a, a memory from Smart which is they've, they've got a very high speed, and, and not only is it high speed, but it's also, it doesn't wear down like original uh, Flash did. It's got a much better li lifetime as Flash. So with Flash, if you keep reading from it, there's no real damage to yeah, it. Yeah, so you what you're talking right about wear leveling, but uh, so you're saying you're using single level uh, memory on the Flash on your EMMC, are you? Not multiple channel or multiple. Uh, Right, we're going, we're going directly to the memory bus. Okay. Hi, John. Thanks a lot for sharing um, Canino's Locos project with us. I like a lot your presentation. And I have uh, three questions. The first one, uh, being here in Curitiba, uh, where could we buy um, Canino's Locos board or the other boards, the Pulga and the other, uh, I don't remember. And um, is there some similar projects in other countries having these issues with import um, 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 prices like um, Argentina, uh, Venezuela, or even Cuba, that is a um, harder situation? And um, in, oh, the third one, oh, oh, I forgot the third question. Let me, let me answer the first questions first, and then, then we yes. can work on that. Yes, okay. please. So currently, can you buy the board? The 1,000 boards which we produced have been produced as a nonprofit research type of thing. So we cannot sell them. Oh. However, if you say, gee, I can contribute this type of work to the project, we can give you one. Okay. We can't sell it to you. We can give it to you. In the next few days, we are working with the, the Brazilian government, because they, they funded part of this project, to come up with a final price for the Labrador. And once that price has been set,
Then we can set up the distribution channel to start selling them to a lot of other people, right? But because of the way that this was funded in the first place, we cannot sell these boards. Okay. But we can give them away. <laughs> That's it's, it's even better at volume. Um, now, Cuba. Cuba is an interesting example here because in the United States, if you try and sell things to Cuba, you run into all sorts of problems with the embargo. Brazil does not have that embargo with, with Cuba. In fact, actually, kind of the opposite. So in Cuba, there's really no reason why we could not sell the Labradors to, to Cubans, OK? Perfect. Or uh, Brazil can sell them. I remember the last question. Uh, is uh, related with the uh, exporting um, Canadians Locos, since it's developed and um, manufactured here in, in Brazil. Uh, it is possible to buy it in other countries without the uh, problems of taxes and... Well, again, if those countries are part of the Mercosur Agreement, then there should be no problem because more than 22% of the value of the product is created in Brazil. So you should be able to sell it to Argentina or to Uruguay. Or I think Venezuela is also part of the Mercosur Agreement. And so those countries, they should be able to sell it without any, tax, any import taxes. To that country, from that country. Selling it to other countries depends on their import taxes of Brazilian products, right? And that's going to be on a country by country basis. So we have to, we have to look into that. That's more, that's more a problem of importers, however, than exporters. We have to, you have to take that into consideration when you make the product. But it's, it's, I want to import something from your country. I have to look at the import duties that my country levels, levers on that, right? So right now, we're, tr we're just trying to solve the problem of the incredibly high import tax. Now, the Raspberry Pi people actually tried to go to the Brazilian government and get the import tax reduced on the Raspberry Pis, and the Brazilian government said no. And that was even before we had this project started. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I'm, obviously, this is a bit of a confession. I have a couple of Raspberry Pis at home, um, despite the freedom problems and some of the other problems with them. Um, and the reason for that is that it's really very convenient to be in an ecosystem that's got lots of other people in it who are doing stuff. And that means that if I want to do something, you know, half or three quarters or 90% of the job has already been done by somebody else. And I'm, I'm really not one of those wheel reinventors unless they're really terribly triangular. Um, so are you trying to build an ecosystem? That, I mean, that's really what the, the Raspberry Pi thing has, 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 has made it a success. Are you, uh, do you have any plans to try and, I don't know, piggyback on any of that? What's your strategy there? Well, my personal strategy, and, and a lot of this depends on the total overall program. But we are, as I said, we are uh, looking at Debian as being the main uh, operating system on this. And of course, you can say Raspbian, but like a lot of other distributions, it's a lot based on Debian. So what we're hoping as we, as we get better operating system support and the operating system more complete, as we start testing some of the Raspbian applications, that either from a binary compatibility standpoint or a software uh, source code compatibility standpoint, that a lot of the projects and things that work with the Raspberry Pi will work with the Labrador without change. Right. I so was the thinking. So GPIO pins, as an example, are compatible with the Raspberry Pi GPIO pins. Right. So I mean, I was thinking also about hardware compatibility. If you're doing something very, very short run, or you know, just as an experiment, then you could buy some random thing and plug it in, and you don't have to do any hardware design work really, and it's quite convenient. Well, I mean, we do have the 40 GPIO pins the Raspberry Pi uses. We have USB support. Um, right. So you've got a header that's Raspberry Pi compatible? Yes. Right. That, that, that is like, you know, a big part of the answer to my question. Great. Um, excellent. Thank you. Uh, somebody should make them in Wales. <laughs> They're already being made in Wales. They're called Raspberry Pis. <laughs> Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, ma'am. No problem. Thank you, John. 
Um, this is really exciting for me indeed. I got involved in DevConf, I think, at um, Germany in 2015, or 20, whatever it was, um, 2014. Can and it was, really, it was really about hardware, yeah. is basically what I wanted to say. So I'm really excited about this. I'd love to see some South South collaboration. If we could, um, I don't know if we can bulk import because that's really difficult, but maybe manufacture in Africa. Um, so I'd love to collaborate and talk further. And I really want one. <laughs> Thank you. The Brazilian government has, because of their funding of this, has asked that before we open up all the designs and stuff, that we register it. And this is to kind of protect it, but our intent is to open up all of the designs over time so that people could manufacture them in Africa or other places. I'm sorry, but we're 10 minutes over time, okay. so we need to stop now. Yes. Thanks. Okay.